<laughs> and hello everybody in this room. Warmly welcome to AI Monday. Uh, my name is Petri Malmelin. I will be mainly co-hosting or ho hosting the, the facilitation today. And then we have Ulla Kraus here um, who has a long history with uh, AI Monday. So have, a, have an introduction please. Okay, hello. Does it work? So my name is Ulla Kruse Lehtonen and uh, I'm uh, uh, heading up uh, Dane Studios uh, Finland and I'm here together with my two co-founders. Uh, we are a data AI analytics consultancy based in Finland and, and in Germany. So, and we have been now uh, uh, hosting uh, this uh, event, AI Monday, since uh, the beginning of this year, took it over from Taival, and are together here with Petri, who is the initial father of the, uh, this, this initiative. So, and there is also in Germany, there are a lot of different chapters happening in Berlin, Munich, and other cities. Uh, and so people, maybe they're also from those cities, some people online, so I hope you in enjoy the show. All right, uh, folks on the, on the stream, there's a way to ask questions, but we will take them at the, mostly at the end. So this is the agenda. So do we have Matti close and do you have a microphone with you? So let me first run through the, through the program and then we have Matti Manonen from Technology Industries um, telling some brilliant, wonderful news. So uh, one and a half hours, um, some news sections first, Matti Manonen to start that and then we have uh, uh, Professor Patrick Florin from uh, Finnish Center AI, FKI, um, uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, Solia uh, Sulkunen from FAIR, Idih. Maybe we will start to learn what these letters mean in a moment. And then we have uh, three uh, longer presentations. Uh, we will have uh, um, Mr. Um, Kevin uh, Hillman from uh, Gerber uh, Industries um, telling a case uh, of an AI. Let's see, accelerated factory in the pharma, pharma business. Uh, looking forward to that. Uh, then we have um, uh, Heli Helakoski uh, from uh, DTT. And the topic there is generative AI in industry. Let's see if we will be hearing some case stories uh, on, on the topic there as well. And then uh, last, we have Vesa Auvinen from Dazzle O. Esa, Vesa has uh, recently published a book and I saw the material, so we will be hearing a few words about metaversumi or metaversum. And hopefully you will be telling us uh, not only kind of uh, existing and possible AI cases in industry, but also cases that are behind the corner. Yes. Uh, Very good. So uh, questions from the room, I will take them uh, at the Q&A part and panel discussion part and questions from the, from the stream. Feel free to type those questions there anytime as we move on. But with that, let's get started. Um, Matti Mannonen, um, Technology uh, Industries of, of Finland, please. Thank you, Petri, and uh, welcome on my behalf as well. Uh, just in case you don't know what Technology Industries of Finland is, we are an association. We have 1,850 members. Our members do uh, two-thirds of Finnish private R&D work, uh, half of Finnish exports and employ about uh, one quarter of Finnish employees, uh, including the <coughs> uh, indirect effects. But what I'm telling you today is our investment on uh, artificial intelligence acceleration, actually, and we are, we are together with our Centennial Foundation, we will put 13.2 million euros in the acceleration of AI in Finland. And actually, uh, why are we doing this? Uh, we, well, I think everybody in this room knows why we are doing it, but anyways, uh, uh, why, why we, how, we, how we justified it to ourselves. It's the fastest developing general purpose technology that is applicable in every business, in every sector. Uh, it brings competitiveness, efficiency. You can use it in R&D. And, uh, and, and it's a disruptive technology, so if you are not in, you will be disrupted yourself. And, and we need acceleration of AI application, AI development, especially in the small and medium-sized companies who don't have the resources themselves. Uh, and, and we want to establish a, a kind of a network which is uh, based on uh, peer learning, cooperation, we build an ecosystem there and, and, and enable a, a joint development of AI uh, 
applications and, and uh, doing joint AI research through that network. Uh, we also need more uh, talent in AI. We, we want to recruit people, top-level uh, researchers or uh, AI experts from abroad to come to Finland and, and work with our companies, with our universities. Uh, and, and the uh, TIF investment is intended to be a catalyzer. So, so this is big, but uh, at the same time it's small. So we need to get all the others uh, joining us and, and, and making a snowball effect so that we will have uh, uh, a lot of more interest, a lot of more investment in AI in the coming years. And of course we have uh, FKI already here, high level research. We have Lumi, uh, high-level high uh, computing power, and we have our technology companies who have been world leaders in their uh, quite narrow segments of expertise. But we will not be able to sustain that world-class uh, leadership unless we use the modern technologies, and AI is one of them. How we are going to spend this money? Actually, we are putting 3.8 million investment in the recruitment of international professionals in AI and uh, and this is uh, uh, and this is going to be 50 percent of the total cost so it's about 7.6 million altogether on on uh, uh, international AI professionals then we will put 2.8 million investment in seed funding of AI development projects in companies means uh, uh, a small portion of the total project uh, budgets, but but uh, try to make people uh, in the companies make their own investments, and we are supporting it to a certain extent. Then we are putting uh, 2.4 million in 120 scholarships to AI master theses carried out in companies. Uh, I hope, and I know that there will be uh, enough applicants for this. There's been interest already uh, quite a lot. And then we will put one million in the es establishment and operation of uh, business-driven AI Finland network that will hopefully attract uh, both business and research and public sector and, and maybe other individuals as well. Uh, we, we need to do this together. We're a small country and then of course we want to expand uh, the cooperation uh, across borderlines, so we will go to Sweden and Europe and wherever. And then our Centennial Foundation is, is giving a grant, 3.2 million, to Alto House of AI, which will be an, an, an AI center run by Alto, and, and, and it will be working in cooperation with the other parts of the investment. And uh, while I have two minutes time, I will not go in detail into these uh, uh, two slides that I have a little bit more uh, explanation about how we're going to spend the money. But, uh, but I can share the uh, information uh, with you, I suppose. Uh, or is it possible, Petri? Yeah, so we can put the slides on. Uh, and there's another one uh, on the applied research and education. But that's basically it. And, uh, and we have, I think, one minute time for questions. <coughs> If any. Any questions to uh, Matti at this point in time? We can ask them questions at the end as well. I think, I think we owe you 13 million and one thank yous. <laughs> 13 million because, because all what you are actually plus million uh, thank yous. And then one big thank you because all this facility and, and uh, the coffees and uh, something else uh, at the end of this session is uh, on, on, on Matti Street. So uh, uh, warm hands to, to well, Matti and thank you. <laughs> I had a friend who, who, who was working in, a, in another company uh, and, and he always said taksnella företagen but taksnella bura bulag et men nu måste vi säga taksnella föreningen men det låter bra tack tack all right uh, where is patrick and then where is uh, solia i think if you both come here at the same time your your pages are there Actually, actually, what, what about these slides? So uh, there's like 85 slides. We are not going to share them all. 
but we can share those, um, let's say, those common slides easily then um, at the end. I need the mic. You, yeah. Yes, so green microphone here. Please. Okay. Uh, uh huh. Ah, okay. So now comes my slides. So you heard al already this uh, FKI, so it's Finnish Center for Artificial Intelligence. Uh, uh, deliberately mispronounced as FKI because it's easier to say. So when you hear the FKI, it's actually FCAI, but a little bit tricky to say. So uh, we are uh, in FKI um, a research hub. So we do research about uh, AI in particular themes. Uh, we are also a so-called flagship of the Research Council, formerly called Academy of Finland. So it means that we do top-level research uh, with uh, uh, high impact. You see some figures here, and we are the, uh, with the core partners are Aalto University, University of Helsinki, and VTT. And I want today, because I have only about two minutes, to mention that we do all kinds of events. So we have these AI uh, Monday things here today, but but uh, that's. Uh, not uh, a mainly FKI thing, we are involved in this, but we are together with many others, but we do also have lots of other events. Uh, events towards the industry, events towards the general public, events towards uh, uh, other researchers. So <clears throat> here are some things coming up. So the first one there is really intended for researchers uh, to in, in, initiate more collaboration with mathematicians. So the, that's the set, center of excellence in inverse problems that we will work with. Then we will have uh, 1st of December in Tampere together with FIMA, an event that's for the industry. And then again, we have an, uh, a forum related to research. So the AIX means AI and some other area X, and they are more related to research. And just to give you a hint about uh, what we have been having before, here we have a long list of events. Uh, for instance, the Aurora AI is an example of an event geared towards the general public, and that was then in, in Finnish because it was for like common people. But anyways, uh, just go to, to our web page. You will see the events there, always updated. And uh, uh, maybe I should mention that uh, we deliberately don't have much things going on on the event front uh, at the end of December and beginning of January because so many people are away. So, so that's why it's a little bit more calm now, but you see that we have lots of things really recently. So that's what I wanted to say about FKI. And now Solia is there ready to continue from, from there with something also related a bit to FKI. Yes, absolutely. We are uh, partners, tight partners with FKI from Finnish AI region. Edith, let's take all information out so you have time to read. Uh, Patrick himself has actually been part of uh, defining this project that is co-funded by 50% by the uh, Commission of EU, the Digital Europe program at the moment. Uh, what we do in Finnish AI region, uh, European Digital Innovation Hub, is that we accelerate the adoption of AI in SMEs, but also added reality, um, high performance computing uh, and cybersecurity. But AI is our spearhead and main focus. Um, our target ver verticals are health, smart cities, and then overall digital service solutions. So basically, if your business would not fit in uh, under the health or smart city categories, we would put it under the digital services. Uh, wanting to say we welcome everybody uh, to our ecosystem and we'll help you out. Uh, we provide services with a big consortium. Um, the big cities from the area, Helsinki, Espoo and Vanta, mainly offering uh, city as testbed services. Then we have the big universities, Helsinki University, um, Aalto University, uh, Metropole and Hagahelia. Uh, through those institutions, we we offer advisory consultation, road mapping services, AI maturity and needs analysis, um, student thesis work, research assistance, um, and proof of concept work for companies. Then we have CSC, obviously offering uh, Lumi and workshops around high performance computing for SMEs. Um, and through CSC, actually, um, the SMEs are entitled to or can apply for business film tuition from 20 to 100,000 euros, <coughs> which is a big benefit. And, and I highly encourage everybody to, to look into this opportunity. 
Um, EIT Digital offers an access to finance uh, service where they find um, international invest investors to support your company and scaling up. Uh, Kira Hub is responsible for the built environment, how to utilize AI in built environment sector, and Helsinki Access Center obviously is the, is the expert of, of any added reality uh, solutions. Hopefully I did not forget anybody from here. And Terespo is taking care of the investor relations. Then we have additional partners. Um, Who's is our data partner? FKI is our research partner. Uh, Teknologia Teollisuuden Liitto Industries um, is another um, partner who can deliver or we can, we can do joint customer management basically with them, try to answer SMEs needs um, in joint manner. Uh, we work very heavily with all the three other EDICs in Finland. There are four altogether with a, t a slightly different focus. Um, uh, we have APB, uh, Varian uh, and Microsoft at the moment as company partners and we of course try to see how we could help SMEs to become part uh, of these big corporations value chain. Uh, and these big uh, corporation partners, uh, we are still searching uh, to increase and strengthen this ecosystem. Yes, Arcada is taking care of the ethical evaluation of, of AI-related solutions. Uh, this is a big initiative. Uh, the Digital Euro program is totally worth of 7.5 billion euros for three plus four years periods of time. Uh, we have altogether 151 EDIs within Europe, which offers a remarkable opportunity uh, to scale up and enter new market areas for the customers that have joined our ecosystem. And uh, well, I'm happy to say that since last uh, spring, uh, when we became actually operative, we have been able to attract uh, already 64 companies um, with, our, with our services. And uh, hopefully we start seeing real impact very soon and we can report those very soon as well. Um, Basically, you can see all the service categories here. Uh, we have close to 40 different kind of services varying from the cons consultation to solution uh, development to testing your solutions in lab environments or city testbed environments uh, to financing services. And, and we hope to see as many companies taking part in our operations as possible because we are able to offer these services free of charge uh, at the moment for SMEs. So please, to our um, log to our web pages and register as customer. Thank you. Um, thank you, Patrick and uh, uh, Solia. We would have uh, two minutes for questions at this point of time. I have a question. Perhaps. Let's start with uh, Professor Florian first. If I wanted to walk to FKI office, where should I go? So you can go to Alto, you can go to the University of Helsinki, or you can go to VTT. Okay. I think it's best to be, uh, how should I say, virtual and approach us first virtually, and then we can tell you, de depending on what is your business, Very good. we can tell you where to go physically. Right. Thanks. And same question to Solia. So if I want to, to, to meet the EDIH, uh, where, where shall I come to see you? If you want to see Fair Edich tonight, uh, please meet with Jenny or Fuvad uh, from hands our up. hands there, up over okay, here. Uh, I unfortunately need to skip, but they will be here to discuss with you. Um, otherwise, if you want to join us later, go to fairedich.fi and register. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we are on schedule. Amazing. Um, first um, of the three longer uh, presentations, um, Mr. Kevin Hillman. Microphone on. And the arrow should be working here. Yes. So, um, warm welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for having me. Um, I would explain a little bit about what my actual expectations and also the expectations of uh, us as Kerber um, are in these expectations of the pharmaceutical industry. What is the factory of the future for them and how is their ambition to be realized? And uh, therefore, I'm as uh, the responsible for digitization, drive you through the topics of uh, getting inspiration, set ambitions to getting ideas to a proof of value and then going to the product which is in production. And I want to start a little bit with who is Kerber. 
I, I think the less of you know it maybe, but um, the Kerber Group is uh, out of 13,000 um, employees. We have our um, principal market leader through, through technology leadership, and therefore we have a high priority uh, to drive the digital transformation, not all, only for our customers, also for us. And we are based in four different industry segments, digital, pharma, supply chain, and technologies with a global footprint. And what is a little bit special uh, at our side, we are a foundation, 100% um, in, in, the, uh, uh, in the ownership of the Kerber Stiftung, and we finance technology innovations. We finance in the last year also a lot in, um, in AI and researchers in AI to improve really these technologies and bring it to life in the production. And therefore, I explained it, digitization in the pharmaceutical industry, what does it mean, end-to-end -end process thinking, what we need for it, and then coming from an ideation to a product in operation. Uh, I want to start first Get a, setting the stage. We focus on digitization not to digitize, we focus on digitization because the trends in the pharmaceutical are going in this direction. Personalized medicine, uh, new business models are coming up. We focus also on impacts on the value chain in the pharmaceutical industry, that there's a high cost pressure actually, uh, also on, on globalization needs. We have a reduced time to market therefore to bring up these new products to the market and also we have to solve all these pains in the pharmaceutical industry, like the equipment efficiencies, um, decreasing the change over times to increase the efficiency, and also to be aware what we could improve by data management. And therefore, I always um, talk about these things a little bit. Um, this, uh, this focuses really on being as a company transparent in the production, flexible in the needs, scalable in the ambitions, and efficient in the production. Because anyone is, uh, has specific needs. We don't have these standard solutions for everything. And therefore, we are not thinking in only manufacturing. Manufacturing means only one equipment to another equipment. We need packaging machines to pack a product and a line. We also have to integrate in thinking in supply chain processes how these products are coming from storage and uh, to the uh, production machines, to the equipment, and which IT infrastructure and which systems and processes did I need. These are three dimensions I always think when I come from analog process to technically digitized processes up to a real digital transformation. And these five levels I've described here are the bioforum. The bioforum standard on pharmaceutical industry is um, uh, a standardization organization which focusing um, on how to standardize special things which are needed to increase the efficiency in the pharmaceutical area. And there are uh, suppliers like um, the big pharmaceutical companies on the world, but also um, us as machine builders, as software companies, as consultancies, and we work together to set all these standards. And this describes the way with keywords from analog, fully manual paper-based production to more digital silos where you integrate new IT systems like MES systems, line management systems, quality management systems to really have your silo in a data-based format to really connect all these informations vertical and horizontal integration of all these things to enable real uh, things like real-time process analytics or to have a f um, uh, electronic batch records which enables you in the future to do review by exception. Today a pharmaceutical process has to be fully reviewed. The batch, I think so, these are hundreds of, uh, of uh, papers, I think so, which have to be written by the pharmaceutical expert to accept the batch. And in the future we only accept these exceptions. And this is a full change, I think so. And then we come to these predictive things where we could bring AI in there, use cobotics and robotics up to an adaptive plant where everything is digitized, where everything is automated, and we have closed loop systems. And therefore, we need end-to-end -end process thinking. 
And every way of us starts with understanding. We're coming from digital maturity assessment, which based on this Bioform model I showed before, to set really this customer spec specific ambition where I want to be to create out of it a strategy to determine the right scenarios, create a roadmap out of it, execute it step by step, and then we become to a factory of the future. And what is really necessary, we have to prioritize. To set the right scenarios, we have to prioritize. And what does it mean, I, I explain afterwards. We want to improve change over processes, or we want to um, um, have less manual interventions to increase something, to reduce something, to save something. And this is a business impact. And therefore, everyone focus on having a better production in the future. And this is one example I brought with me. It, it looks complex, it looks big, but these are new dimensions of uh, thinking in a pharmaceutical process. In the middle, this is an example from an inspection process. When I have a vial, I have to inspect the quality before uh, there's a really a, a good product. When I take insulin or something, I have to know 100% quality. And this is only the core process, but I have also the preparation processes and also the end of uh, production processes and all the complexity from process systems from the IT perspective. But when I know this and I have an assessment, I really know my current level, where I be, to set really the baseline where I want to grow, set my ambition for the future, and then I have a planning interval for the next years. Also, how can I step by step digitize and all these green or blue elements in there are specific things, get the data, get the right product in there, connect everything, and then create business value out of it, integrate the right production. And this is possible greenfield as well as brownfield, and not only for new cool facilities, which focusing fully on this uh, digitization. And now I want to explain a little bit, this was really theoretical to bring these uh, concepts and these preparations to production. This is a short overview how a pharmaceutical production in high level looks like. You have a production from API production to a filling line in a, a liquider process to inspect these processes, to assemble them like um, these uh, insulin cartridges, uh, to label them, buffer them. You have track and trace systems to um, cartonize them and bring it back to the warehouse. But what is really necessary is when I talk about these three dimensions of processes, to talk about also supply chain processes, how these robots or cobots bring from a warehouse products to the systems, and also all the IT systems you needed. You have to real uh, the control about the whole line, about the whole processes every time. You, uh, you have to know where to increase the efficiency, what is maybe uh, a hurdle, why, why there is a loss in production. And you get this transparency by line management systems, by interconnection to MAS systems, to warehouse management and fleet systems. And in the future, processes in the packaging industry directly request by these systems to the warehouse, the processes, a corporate brings it in the machine and there's no one integrated. The people could really focus on their uh, specifications, I think so, really on this production and not to solve problems. And therefore, we always think about in these nine dimensions when we talk about factories of the future, advanced automation, data-driven decision-making, a seamless customer journey, flexibility, all these things. Because when you think end-to-end, -end, you have to think about the speci uh, speciality where, where you want to integrate something. And therefore, we have this value chain with the IT systems as a higher level overview. And now we could place our use cases on this value chain. And here are some examples what we do with AI and pharmaceutical production, what we bring normally to our customers. Increase efficiency of logistic equipment. Closed loop supply chain material handling with cobotics controlled by AI algorithms. AI and visual inspection to increase also uh, the performance, what are real faults or what are good products. Performance optimization in production, predictive maintenance, a little bit buzzword, but predictive maintenance could be also real. Uh, line clearance and change over opti optimization by object detection, anomaly detection, and also increasement of all these protocols which were needed. 
advisor chatbots for production or uh, these digital twin um, uh, processes for um, R&D to manufacturing, stock management prediction, or synthetic creation of images. And I bring, brought uh, two examples for these live applications with me. Um, I want to start with my first um, example. This is um, the AI and visual inspection. And uh, therefore, I have the case of generative AI. How we use generative AI in the classical pharmaceutical production. We use image generation. When you uh, produce a pharmaceutical product, you have to val validate it. I explained it before with the vial. It has to be 100% good. And now uh, you have to sample a lot of um, uh, pictures from or images from, from, the, from the good and the bad vials to train your algorithms that the machine said, yes, it's a good product or it's a bad product. And therefore you have big losses, I think so. And even every time you have a new product, you, you need a lot of time to go to market with it. And therefore I want to explain a little bit what is needed to classify a product. You have different categoristics on the vial. Maybe when you take a picture, you have different light perspective, different orientations of a product when you have an image, different sizes of a product or different positions. And therefore, the customer needs defect kits to validate the processes. Every time when the defect kit uh, ha has been used, 100% of it uh, should be detected by the machine. If not, the full batch has gone. And uh, therefore, it could be 100% sure that, that we need it. And therefore, we need a lot of examples to, to um, also uh, overcome all these um, defect kits to really sample it. How these defects look like are this. Here's an example. Maybe there is a crack in, in this glass of a vial. And then it should be out. It's a defect product. What are we doing now is using generative AI to create a sample base, to create really artificial uh, intelligent build, uh, images with these uh, bad examples, with cracks, with different crack types, with uh, some uh, specifications in there to generate all these images. And this looks a little bit like this. We have a database with all types of cracks, with all types of things we see in the market from, from uh, different uh, libraries. And then we generate this. And this is not like using Photoshop, I think. So this is really uh, a proven situation there which could be used in validated um, processes. And uh, therefore, we have our uh, some uh, real images with this feature mask where we have our gener AI model. We have now the situation where we generate images and then we have artificial intelligent uh, or artificial images together with real images and then we could go faster to market with production. This is a real increase for a customer. The next um, example is AI and line management. Customers have paper-based production production in one line or production in the side where MES. And therefore you have these first layers of digitization. You come from a production step from one machine up to a line, up to an MES system, up to ERP systems and cloud systems in these areas. And we created a system which integrates vertically and horizontal all these informations digitally uh, that you don't need paper in, in any of these steps. And um, therefore, we connect with standardized equipment. We manage in pharmaceutical standards all these processes. We execute by guiding operations. We de detect by uh, assisted line clearances. We are uh, modeling processes and workflows to make it really applicable, the digitization and also SOP processes. And we integrate condition monitoring and data analytics in there. And I want to explain what AI-powered recommendation, the guided by recommendations, could look like in these areas. If you see a pharmaceutical process workflow, normally you have to start the production by initiating an electronic batch. Now uh, we integrate everywhere camera systems and detection points, which were analyzed if there is a recognition of objects. And the system directly recognized if there are maybe 
uh, only paper or is it maybe a broken vial with a product? And then the operator were directly guided through these interconnected systems. What product um, is in there? What is the type of, um, um, of uh, uh, a thing which has to be cleaned? What uh, I have to done in removal? And then uh, they also re-inspect uh, the system that uh, on one side the operator is secured by the process, but also everything is fully documented in the protocol and then we could use this review by exception and don't need paper anymore. And the same example by continuous uh, shop floor improvement. We get the transparency or we need the transparency over the whole processes to detect something and then we could use the analytics of, um, of this process to really integrate a human in the loop that they help to interpret, to give the right recommendations afterward and then you, you, you bring new insights in these recommendations to directly integrate it in the SOP processes to guide the operator through these processes and then you have a continuous improvement uh, processes with really a closed loop system which brings more efficiency to pharmaceutical production. And therefore I'm at the end of my presentation. I, I have one question for you. What is the next step you could take also in all your productions? I think so every one of us has to go step by step into digitization and advanced uh, use uh, this adoption of advanced technologies. And I think everyone has examples for it. Therefore, maybe if you want to discuss more of these cases, I'm afterwards at the Dane booth and outside of my colleagues, and there we could discuss a little bit about these cases. Thank you, Kevin. Two minutes for questions. Anybody in the room with a question? I have a question. Sure. <laughs> um, who in your company comes with the idea that this is an area where we could utilize AI? I think that this is a corporate strategy that we're focusing on these things because uh, we do continuously trend monitoring and this is one of the mega trends I think so we have to focus on and have to adapt. And also the customers are really pushing it uh, that we brought up new ideas, new products, new ways of integrating these things in the production and to make it live on a validated process. Do you, do you train the, the people in, in Kerber for kind of being AI positive or innovative or? The, the experts are sitting here from Dane Studios. Ah. They, are, they are also training us and explaining us uh, what this really means uh, for, for us in daily business and also all our colleagues. There you are. Very good. Uh, anyone in the room, any question? There's one. Uh, take the, take the mic. Oh, uh, I'll repeat the question, just say it. Yeah, okay, yeah. The question on, on build or buy, like, the fraction. So, so how much did you do, you, like, on, on code versus how much there were already solutions you could So like. for the people on the line, they don't hear you. Uh, uh, build or buy was the short question. Okay, the yeah. I have a microphone here. Uh, uh, in, in, in my explanations, the most things are built applications by uh, myself, but I uh, also showed um, the, the, the sentence of business impact. And within business impact, there's also a business case preparation. Therefore, we also do a lot of these uh, buy things and partnering. Partnering is a, a good thing that we could uh, directly integrate applications from partners into the production to make it sure that it is possible to use fast as possible. And one last question before we change the speaker. Who in the room can talk of, of Gerber? So you and was there somebody else in the room? Yeah, okay, so. All right, um, more people coming in. Break time, so come, come in, come in, yes. just, just changing, changing the speakers. So hey, uh, thank you. Dr. Heli Helakoski from VTT. Floor is yours. Thank you. So hello everybody, nice to be here. I'm Heli Helakoski from VTT and everybody has said the 
where the letters come. This comes from uh, technical research center of Finland. So now you know the Technologian Tutkimuskeskus VTT in Finnish. <laughs> if you don't know. So I started my AI career around more than 20 years ago. I started with uh, adopting agent technology for the industry, for, for business networks. And I've been doing this a long time, although now I'm in the managerial level. But I was a bit surprised around a year ago when I first, first started using generative AI, chat GPT. I was really astonished how it felt like um, discussing with human beings. So it was like, even as an AI researcher, I was surprised. I'm, I'm not sure where this goes <laughs> in the future. So we have been discussing about the generative AI for, for, for now around a year. And of course, we can do very authentic content by using these tools, text, images, videos, everything, audio, synthetic data and these kind of tools. And the difference between this and the previous AI booms we have had is that everybody have access to these tools and it's, they are easy to use. You don't need any education. You can start just using them very easily and use your imagination. How do you use them? And then, then start using them and so on. But I think this is, uh, I think this is the major difference if, you com if, you, if we compare the previous AI booms. That now this is a kind of democratic tools. Everybody can use it. You don't have to invest in a way for that. And but when we talk about uh, manufacturing industry, there's a plenty of AI tools. And generative AI tool is only a one tool that maybe it. Uh, easiest interaction between the end user and the technology. Because you, you get a kind of human feeling when you ask, for example, chat GPD questions, and then you have in the background, you have the information that the other AI technologies can provide to you. But I think in manufacturing industry, we still need to have a combi combination of all these different AI technologies in order to make them really really effective. And like I said, there's a plenty of tools. And now we are talking a lot about uh, the uh, tools that generate text. We probably we all use them already in our everyday, um, everyday life. But we can also produce audio, voice, code, design, images, and video. Uh, if you think about the manufacturing industry, I think the most uh, interesting ones are how do we use uh, a design gener generation in manufacturing and also the code, code generation. I think these have uh, plenty of possibilities. And then there's a list of tools and uh, plenty of plenty of tools. And if you then click the uh, landscape link after after this presentation, when you get this, there's a map of a map map of all the tools by category categorization. And I think the number of tools are growing all the time. Uh, uh, we, we at VTT, we have been talking a lot about the large language models uh, with manufacturing industry. And then how do you use the uh, LLMs in manufacturing? The text generation, you can, do, you can use it for training and knowledge transfer. You can uh, use it for uh, skills development and, of course, maintenance instructions and your user guides. There's a lot of text-based information in manufacturing industry. And this provides a more effective, more easier way to produce this kind of information. And also in multiple languages, because uh, majority of the Finnish industry is working in, in global scale. And then you need to generate this information in multiple languages. And of course, you can use, you can ask questions and you can do, do church, uh, search for your for your company, company uh, information. And also, I already mentioned about the software programming for, for the routine tasks. So this is one thing that companies are already using. They are using uh, this uh, 
attributes, how to, how to make the routing tasks more efficient, how to modify, modify it, and how to make updates for the, for the software. And if we think about the, what kind of potential uh, gen a, a generative AI have, have in manufacturing chain, I think I have the same chain than, than Ke Kevin already presented, and some of these some of these were already presented, like this uh, quality management. The previous presentation was quite close to that. But when we start about the R&D cycle, uh, there's very impressive tools, very Im impressive results already. How do you develop the new materials? The, in a kind of you, you want to develop new materials with exceptional properties. So the AI algorithm can predict the structure and dynamic properties of any materials. Um, this is very promising thing, and this is one thing which is very interesting uh, for the research. And then the second one interesting for the industry is product design. How do you how do you design the products? How how do you give uh, the code? A kind of parameters, cons constraints, design calls. What kind of product do you want want to develop? And then you get um, various uh, uh, various proposals of the new design solutions uh, that uh, that really face the face the uh, face the conditions. Of course, these are in the early points, but. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I saw in one, one conference about the examples of the product design. Product design in the manufacturing industry, and it's very interesting. And maybe the quality management and customer services, these are quite obvious. How can you use this? You can, of course, use the, all, all the material you have in, in your com company. Use AI, AI to find the solutions, and so on. So, but this is a kind of, in my opinion, this is in, in, in the development phase. In, uh, there is possibilities in each of the, each of the uh, value chain process. So this is a kind of thing we have to, have to really follow carefully. I have one, one example of the Finnish company <coughs> from Vertsila. They have a case study they are developing a generative AI toolkit, and the aim is to empower the, empower the employees at Wärtsilä. And also, of course, therefore, they will provide more business value. So they have their own technology and data platform, LLMs in there, and also the Wärtsilä-specific data. So all the, all the information there uh, is relying on, on the company-specific data. And then the Wärtsilä experts, they have this kind of uh, uh, service when they, of course, uh, keep, uh, make the global maintenance. Uh, they have the service center at Vasa. So these are the people who knows, who knows their products, their spare parts, and maintenance issues and service provisions. So they, they are the key persons to develop this kind of system, and then, therefore, helping all the company, company of the, of these, uh, of these questions, and then they, they think that they can provide more customer feedback analysis, and also help the help the field field services. Uh, this means maintenance around the world and spare part identif identification, because they have a lot of combination of manufacturing. Uh, composition, uh, this kind of machines, marines, and so on. So there's uh, managing the spare parts and identif identification of the spare parts is it's a huge problem. And of course, they will uh, summarize the lessons learned. And this is kind of, uh, I find this interesting because the, the, they emphasize that they want to empower the people. And then the second one is creating business value. This is a kind of help, helping people at Wärtsilä to make their work better and to help the other people working in Wärtsilä making, making their work better. 
So there's a lot of lot of possibilities in in generative AI, but all of course it's always combination with uh, uh, other AI technologies. And I already said it's very very nice to use its human-like response. Easy to use. Everybody can use it, and it can manage a huge amount of data. We we know that it can interpret and uh, manage lots of data, for example. And it's very highly versatile. We, do, we still don't know where, where we can use it, or we don't maybe haven't find all, all, the, all the use cases working where we can use it. And it's improving all the time. For example, one year ago, ChatGPT was totally different than now. So it's, uh, it's improving all the time. And it's capable of many for many tasks. So it's upon our, I would say, in imagination. How do we adopt these technologies? How do do we have imagination enough to adopt these technologies? And can we can we think in a way out of box? But there's of course some limitation, and you probably have have met these. They, they can be not so reliable. They can pretty much answer anything for you, so you always have to check, uh, check, check, check the correctness of the information. And it's all, oh, of course, it's not always up-to-date information. There might be old information, and then you, then you have to notify also that. And then one, one thing, it's the explainability of the AI. This is the common problem. We don't really know, don't know where the, what are the uh, where the answers come from, so we don't have the transparency for the process of making the AI, AI decisions or uh, AI proposals. And privacy and data security concerns, there, there is also one thing you have to think about it. And uh, of course the risk management, you also have to use, always have to use your own, own data you have to take care of the data ownership and organizational impact. And then one thing, you have to think about the social and in environmental impact. But if we think about the organizational impact, when we use these kind of, these kind of technologies, there has been uh, done a kind of research that 44% uh, of our workers' core, core skills have to be reskilled in the future, within the next five years. This is a huge number, and this relies on the uh, using AI as a part of, part of our solutions in industry. And this is one thing that we have to think about when we are working with machines. I have only, only questions here in this, because I don't know the answers. We are researching this right at, at the moment. That what, how do we... How do we prepare for this change? Uh, the, uh, the industry will become more, more and more complex. AI is not the only techni technology that will come there. And when we work with the machines, how do we work with machines? What is the, what is the work division between human and the machine? And who is responsible for everything if something goes wrong? And one thing maybe I raise up, how do we ensure the human skills and knowledge because now we rely a lot of artificial intelligence, how we still keep our, our own common sense, our own understanding of the industrial environment. So we have to be very careful about this. But these are the questions I will, uh, maybe we can discuss about these later on. And then about the conclusions, I, I think the manufacturing industry will be more, more and more multi-technology environment. It will be more complex, in, complex, complex as a whole. We need to a kind of keep eye on the development and start to use, start to use the new technology uh, uh, as soon as possible, but not in not adopting them first testing, testing making small trials, pox, and so on. And maybe when we think about the generative AI, use your common sense. It's not reliable. It, it doesn't make miracles. Uh, but everybody knows how to, how, to, 
how to use common sense in that. And one thing I want to emphasize that when we are starting using this, this will change the whole working, working life in industry. So people are the ones who make the change. So please keep the, everybody on board. Discuss with the people about, about this, about these new technologies. They probably use them at their personal life. So the good ideas are, are, are on the employees. So thank you. I think I made it. <laughs> Thank you, Heli. We are right on time. We'll take the questions to you at the end with everybody else. So yeah. next person on stage should be Vesa Auvinen uh, from Dazzle. Yeah, no, it? Please. Thank you. <clears throat> Question to the tech guys. Do I need to push any button? No. No? OK. They do the pushing. Excellent. It's automated. Yes. Great. So, my name is Vesa Avinem. I come from the company called Dazzle, and it's my pleasure to be with you here, talk about the AI uh, and industry. I take a little bit, uh, maybe strategic and future-oriented view on this. Uh, our company's purpose, and also my purpose, is to help our clients to see, build, and live better futures. In Finnish, we call it tulevaisuusilo. These dark times, we need more joyful futures. So basically, it includes foresight, strategy, innovation, and especially how we put these things into action, change the culture, mindset, and use the best potential also from the technology. I wrote a book about metaverse. It's in Finnish. Um, if you are interested in, it's kind of a guide for leaders and everyone who is curious about metaverse, AI, technologies, strategies and futures. And I have an early Christmas gift for you with code meta 20 all capital. You can buy it from the kauppakamari.fi. It's Black Monday. <laughs> yeah, it is Black Monday. Um, okay. So, if you look in the situation now, I think we are living the plus AI era. So we have the existing product services companies, we have digitized something, and now the AI, uh, analytical AI, generative AI uh, comes into this. But I think we are moving into the A plus era. So the data, AI, other technologies become one of the core value drivers combined with humans. Uh, and this is going to be a big change. And we can see already some of the bigger and smaller companies becoming AI first, uh, with AI first strategies. So when we combine AI, uh, analytical and generative AI with other technologies, also with humans and new ways of uh, creating value, we look into the whole value chain, customer side, our internal oper operations, partners and supply chain, we find a lot of use cases. And of course, if we have a good core business, we have to improve it. Efficiency, productivity, and AI, other technologies can help in that, this. And it seems that most of the uh, use cases, when you go through thousands of them, is improving existing. And it is important. But the big uh, disruptions are coming, and the biggest growth and innovations could be when we create new product services, business models, and maybe totally re reinvent our business. So we can expand to other businesses or we can uh, kind of think that this is not our business. <laughs> we use this, our capabilities in other business areas, new purpose on top of the, uh, a new vision and strategies on top of the, the new products and services. Uh, we had excellent examples of, of the generative AI, and when we combine the other technologies, uh, I think the exponential <laughs> kind of futures we have been waiting for are coming uh, uh, already here. And I think uh, everybody had their popcorns and glass of wine watching the open AI, AI drama, and there is the Q star 
is the new revolution in the algorithms. But when you look into every, every tech giant, they, they are creating the LLMs and putting AI in everything. Uh, Microsoft leading, leading the way. But also in China and open source uh, solutions should be on your future's radar. Uh, this is interesting, just as an example. Microsoft announced uh, in Ignite event this co-pilot that comes to the Dynamics 365 guides and combines the generative AI and then uh, mixed reality. So basically, if you had the digital twins and all the data, you start talking with the uh, machines and uh, factories and everything. So uh, step by step assistance, as we saw earlier, on demand information, uh, streamlined documentation. Just as an example, uh, this is already here in, in, in pilot mode. And also from Microsoft, but NVIDIA and other tech giants, they are offering uh, voice cloning, they are offering uh, avatars. That's one interface for us, easy to um, kind of uh, relate to and uh, have a converse with AI. Um, so the things that took a lot of effort, money, five years ago, two years ago, now are coming democratized and you get everything from the cloud. Uh, very reasonable monthly <laughs> payments. But just an example that the AI and generative AI, they advance, but other technologies advance too. And the, the combination of these technologies might create new value for your company. Uh, we were part of the VTT, Human Driven Industrial Metaverse um, program. And in this, uh, I liked that it was human driven. And then we bring the other technologies. It was, it was mostly for the, for the existing businesses in industries. And we tried to find a lot of use cases for metaverse AI and other technologies and the human collaboration from R&D production deployment supporting maintenance. If you're interested about this, there's a great vision uh, paper about that. A tip. Now, when we have all these use cases, how do you can categorize them and how in your company you could think about uh, what kind of use cases, AI use cases you could use. Uh, this is a Gardner AI Opportunity Radar. There are many other tools, but just an, uh, as an example. So there's external customer facing, internal, internal operations, and you map the use cases. But also, what is your ambition level for the innovation? Um, is it, is it uh, everyday AI or Gardner's term, game-changing AI? And also strategic-wise, you could defend your position, extend your position, up enter your position. I translate it to my language, improve existing, create new uh, and reinvention. And then you could have a discussion with your board and uh, developers and um, management team that what are we going to uh, kind of focus on and this could be uh, uh, a dream for many companies but there are no competencies so it might be this might be better solutions than trying to go AI first uh, right away but that that is the fuse, future AI will infuse in everything our operations our products our services our strategies so and when you, you know many of these use cases, and I'm not going to go through. So many of them are improving existing. So if uh, we can use the sensors, machine uh, vision, we can use uh, hearing, and we can improve health and safety, quality control, predicted maintenance. Maybe this is coming also, that we can create a new business model on this if you are in, in maintenance business. And then more and more you look into these use cases, you can see that uh, there's a dream about the value chain optimization, supply chain optimization, scenarios, simulations. And as we saw earlier, using it in the design, build, operate, kind of like life cycle. Uh, 
this is interesting small case. Uh, NASA used generative AI in the design phase to create a new spare part and actually they created it faster, lighter and totally new kind of shape that the human designers wouldn't even think about. So this has become now part of the, the design process and when they combine with 3D printing uh, it's very exciting future what, what they can do uh, also in space. When we bring in robotics, this is from the World Robotics uh, Report 2023. Of course we see the industrial robotics advancing, cobots, AI becomes part of the robots, they learn faster, you can talk with them and the humanoid robots over there. But I think the humanoid robots are actually coming faster. They have been coming last 20 years, but now could be the time that uh, Amazon is pu pulling, putting a lot of effort in these humanoid robots, simple tasks they can use. And when we combine AI and metaverse virtual areas, these robots can learn while they work. And new skills you just download from, from the matrix. Uh, China is putting a lot of effort in um, AI and robotics and they are also building um, building uh, humanoid robots and some people thought this was a joke Tesla's Optimus robot actually it, it seems to be advancing uh, faster and of course they have a new Grok model using the X in information so that could be also make this uh, advance a little bit faster. Interesting case how these different um, kind of technologies come together. BMW partnered with uh, Nvidia and Siemens. They created um, digital twins from everything, from the smallest parts to the cars, to the products and lines, to the uh, uh, factory, the area, humans. And they globally designed a new factory using NVIDIA's Omniverse platform. And the results are very impressive. So they totally reinvented the design process. They can now design new factories faster, make it reality faster, uh, improve quality and efficiency. And look at the numbers. They are not just 2%. They are halving their design time and build time. So, um, but also it will affect other. The metaverse AI becomes the interface for the factories, cars, and you can use the digital assets. When you design a new uh, uh, digital twin of car, you can actually already show it to the customer and <laughs> you can optimize in so many different ways. And this I think will be the future, even for smaller if you are building chairs or whatever. So this is not only for big companies. Some leader from NVIDIA said that they were really surprised. They were expecting the SMEs to jump in into this AI, uh, kind of like uh, a digital twin omniverse world. But the car makers were the first ones and they are really uh, advancing fast. Of course, I'm not going to go in, into this. They are using AI in everything. And I think BMW is one of the companies who wants to be a AI plus company. And as we saw from Kerber and others, it, it's, it's a huge task. But when you start building it, they're using, using the new value drivers, uh, you might disrupt the um, uh, competition. Well, with automotive Telia case, Robot, LiDARs, pictures, makes a digital twin with AI from the existing kind of like uh, facilities. So it seems that our future is that uh, some of the workers, companies, teams, uh, even societies will get these superpowers. And the, the gap between the forerunners and those who are left behind is widening. So at least you, you should start experimenting and learning as fast as you can. But just as a reminder, 
adopting new technology, you need to take everyone on board. Think about the new mindsets, skills, um, leadership, culture you need. So, hopefully we use these superpowers to see and build better futures. And the next Vappu, we are going to have these AI friends, colleagues and machines having a champagne with us. So, that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Vesa. Um, I will do two things while the key speakers uh, should be preparing for, for the panel discussion. So the first thing is to show this page. Um, people on, on, the, on the stream and people in the room, the question to all of you is that um, what topics would you like to be hearing in upcoming AI, month, uh, AI Monday events here in Helsinki? Um, spring 2024. So uh, there's a Mentimeter uh, survey, it's uh, anonymous, so uh, uh, if you write there some filthy stuff, uh, we don't know who wrote that, but you don't. Uh, but uh, uh, just a reminder, today's theme was uh, industry, so we are not having like January or February another industry theme AI Monday. But uh, think, think broadly, think your friends, families, colleagues, uh, what AI topics might interest you and uh, please visit there. And then I want to tell you a... Um, short good mood story and then we'll take the questions. So uh, people on the line, I have now three, three really good questions here. I will, I will ask them from the uh, um, folks here, but um, the good mood story goes, goes like this. Um, who has met this gentleman? Who knows who he is? Wow, uh, one, one fourth maybe or so. Seitsemän Seinäholo is, is, a, is, a, is an orchestra, so my parents uh, would, that generation would know. Pentioskari Kangas founded a, a, a music group called Seitsemän Seinäholo. He's a serial entrepreneur. He's running an um, amazing place in, in Nantali. It, it's, um, it's a recreational place that feels like being 150 years old. Very traditional. It's played for companies for brainstorming or, or, or just uh, relaxation. And uh, uh, I told him um, around 10th of November that um, OpenAI has now established uh, this uh, platform where you can do GPT AI applications. Ben Teoskri told me, how about you come over here and let's, let's try it. So his attitude as an 80 years old uh, entrepreneur was that, that don't stay still, let's do it. What we did, uh, we did in two hours uh, uh, an application that worked. So the aim was that we wanted to do a PAL, a proposal PAL, so that when a, when a group of people, let's say all the professors say that, hey, we would like to come to Herrankukkar, there's 55 of us, we'd like to stay overnight there, we would like to do ice fishing, and we would like to um, eat uh, local food, and we would like to do this and that and that. Um, can we do it? What, what other things you can propose to us, and how much will it cost? That's a very typical inquiry to, to Herrankukkar. So we trained the model by taking a pile of uh, five to seven pages thick existing uh, PDF uh, offers they've done in the past year or two. Uh, we took two Excel files co containing uh, kind of bottom-up pricing information and then top-down pricing information. And um, we also wanted that the application to be able to make a polite uh, answering letter to the inquirer. Uh, the price and uh, a, a picture of you that relates to the group of, of people asking them. So, so there might be like a picture of Alto, Alto University um, uh, uh, sweeping it with Vihta, uh, so kind of uh, the, the, the building would go to sauna or something, something funny, something uh, uh, hilarious. And we nearly dropped from our chairs because uh, in two, uh, two, two hours later it all worked. And not only that, I asked that, do you, uh, Pentioska, do you have ever uh, German visitors here? Well, yeah, sure. Do you have uh, Spanish visitors? Seldom, but sure. So this tool we made in two hours, it masters, I don't know, tens of languages. So, um, oh, 
uh, I was looking at the wrong picture, but anyhow, this is, this is the story here in, in, in English. So what we did, and it, it all worked, as I just explained. And my friend Pentios Krikangas, 80 years and a half, wanted to sell, send his greetings to this audience. Um, keep the tool sharp and current. Go for AI. Let's take the questions. So, um, <laughs> Actually, there's a question for Matti, so, but if you, if you join, actually, and I think it might be better. Do you mind standing? That's okay. Yeah. yeah. So, um, let's take the first question. I think this goes to Matti. It's about the funding. Surprisingly. <laughs> yeah. So, what share of, of public and private funds will go to so-called non-controlled AI, meaning from outside of OpenAI and the other leaders, and how Lumi will be available to small and, and medium-sized businesses in the three. Uh, first of all, we, we have not defined in which kind of AI the funding will go. It's up to the companies and the, and the research organizations to define that. So uh, we are open to all kinds of proposals. Open. <laughs> uh, and, and the next question. Uh, uh, about what it was about. Um, how Lumi will be available to the uh, smaller well, medium-sized businesses in the industry? I think that we are not controlling Lumi, but, mm. uh, but of course uh, it is available for SMEs already now uh, because it's part of a European program and, and you can use it, uh, the SMEs can use it. Uh, of course you, you should be able to talk with the CSC on on, on finding out how to use it, but uh, but it's 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 available po for SMEs at the moment, and and uh, Finland has a certain quota because we have invested quite a lot, uh, not all of the f all of the cost, but but we have invested in it. So so Finland has a certain quota for public research and also for for private uh, private uh, calculation. So however you want yeah. to go. Very good. Thank you. Next question here is uh, to Kevin, and it goes following. What department or which person in a company should be the one starting to implement AI? Where does the change start? I always um, prefer to integrate also the CEO of a company <laughs> into the process, that he is the leader also in bringing up all to empowerment. Um, but it, it depends on the business driver, I think, so you're focusing on. I think so a lot of companies are also interesting, which are normally in the industry segment from production, but they are really interesting from an HR perspective because it's a change um, of, of work, and therefore they are interested how to use it, and, and therefore everyone should be a, a cultural uh, entrepreneur to, to empower others to use these technology uh, in their daily business. And then these great ideas are coming up and everyone feels involved and try to inter integrate it in their daily business. Heli or, or Vesa, would you like to add something? Who should start the AI journey in the industry company? Um, definitely we need the support from the top management CEO. And, uh, but also that's a good question. How? the cultural entrepreneurship and every, I think this AI is for everyone, should be. But of course you have the agents and forerunners and you support them to create the cultural change. I agree the CEO, but of course there's, you can always find the early adopters from the company. So focus on them and then they will spread the, spread the message to others. So. Thank you. The next, maybe, maybe sure, I can, please, Martin. I can comment on, uh, we have a lot of, 90% of our companies are SMEs, and you don't have anyone in many of those who actually knows much about, uh, so you have to get the S CAO involved, but, uh, C uh, but, but it's not enough because he doesn't know or she doesn't know either that much. So there, there has to be somebody external, that's why we are suggesting these scholarships, mm -hmm. uh, that there will be somebody who is doing a master thesis on, on AI and, and brings new knowledge, brings two hands 
and a brain to the company and, and, and gets it going. Uh, and and that, that's, I think, that, uh, that has see been seen very valuable from all member companies. Um, and was it so that, that um, technology at the, source, the, the, the membership companies, they are uh, on, on their shoulders, more than 50% of Finland's uh, export is, is lying on, on those companies. Yes. It's pretty amazing. All right, the next question goes to all, and maybe we start from Vesa, and we'll, we'll come this, this way then. Um, is AI already good for all industries, or are some specific industries in, in better position than others? Are we all equal, or are somebody more equal than, than the rest of us? Well, of course, there are differences between industries and companies, and you should see what, what, what is the life cycle of your company, and then also what is your strategic ambition for the whole of company. So this should be also the board, the owners, especially SMEs, should be involved. How they define the ownership strategy, then the business strategy, and in, inside that the technology AI with human potential. But of course tech companies are advancing fast, um, car companies are advancing fast, some companies are highly regulated, there are differences between that, so there are differences. But I think from every industry you can find the forerunner companies, uh, hopefully it's you uh, or your, your partner, so that it varies. Yeah, I would say so. Of course, I, I like manufacturing industry and process industry because I work there. I should, you should start there. But anyhow, there's a lot of uh, differences between the industries and some other early, early adopters, like the pharmaceutical industry. It, it seems to be an early ad adopter. But I, I wouldn't say that the, there's some, some industries behind, so I think we should promote this to every, every industry. I wouldn't ma make the choice. Yeah, I definitely could agree. Um, everything was right before. I think so. These highly regulated industries are maybe not the fastest in bringing it to production, but they are also really interested in to be aware of what is possible and also going this way. And I think so. There's uh, no barrier for every, any industry to to try it, to use it because there are different segments where to use and where to have the benefits out of it. But definitely in mobile industry or car industry, this is an efficiency driver which they really want to integrate there and therefore they are the early adopters. But um, actually with bringing up in good interesting use cases, maybe other departments are not so highly regulated, could also integrate it in, in this regulatory industry and enable the others to also using it into production. And if I may just add, uh, of course using maybe the Gardner radar or whatever, you can start with the internal processes first and then if you want to, you want to, you can go into the customer site and then reinvent products and services, but don't do it all the time. If you're a startup, then you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, uh, I think that the only thing you have to do is to collect data because that's, a, that's the ingredient that you need when you're using AI. But there are a lot of very low-hanging fruits in, in marketing and, and business development, these kind of issues. You don't have to go to R&D and, and, and even to the process development. You can, you can just make it more uh, efficient in your uh, white-collar work. And, and, and of course, you come, the co-pilots are coming in. So everybody, I mean, it's there in your current software, you don't have to find anything new, actually, to, to utilize AI. Yeah, um, my, my background is in, in big transformation programs, and I afterwards often think that why did some change initiative was so successful, uh, and sometimes they are not that successful. So what's the biggest differentiator? And my conclu conclusion is that it's, it's about people. So a successful change is the one where people change their thinking and behavior. And therefore, I'm, I'm kind of thinking that in this AI, it's such a hot potato now. The pressure is so, you know, we, we don't know what's behind the corner, but, but we need to have the pioneers. And I really like this, I saw you, you showing this Gartner wheel. You can think that, let's start from there, or let's start from there. 
Let's take a few questions from this room and people on the line, feel free to ask, uh, type there a few more questions. Um, at some point, if you kindly text me the, the, the good questions that we will take. But uh, there's one question in the background. I'll take the green microphone to the back. So uh, put the green on, please. Tell your name and uh, ask the question, please. Hi, uh, my name is Tom Hamdi from Birds on Mars. I want to follow up on your question you had about which industries are um, are more or has a have a head start. Um, I heard and read a lot that it used to be those who have their data stores in order. So whoever has their daughter well stored and well labeled will have an head, uh, will be will have an advantage with AI. Do you think this has fundamentally changed with Gen AI, generative AI? Uh, from, from my perspective, it depends definitely on the on the use case where to use generative AI. But structured data or a, a data strategy for it is definitely a beneficial case to increase um, the productive use of of these applications. And um, yeah, mm, yeah, maybe you can use generative AI with less data than you use or artificial intelligence. So. Uh, there's some 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 examples you we showed that it's how easy it is to use. So if you think about some heavy AI solutions, then you need really the data in in place. But this is maybe this is an easy easy start for uh, use start using AI. Well, maybe I can give you an example. We we did our uh, uh, a new video about. Uh, Thief using AI, and, and Sherpa was our partner there. And there was only one person, uh, our managing director gave the, like the script to the video, and then, then uh, AI did it. And then uh, my colleague uh, gave the voice to the video, and, and now the video is speaking with Helena Soimakallio's voice. And, uh, and then uh, the, all the pictures, and actually the movie inside, uh, it was created by the AI, and then of course it was created with uh, ready-made tools, and uh, and then uh, we had to change most of the pictures because they were American, but and we are in Finland, but uh, but actually uh, only one person was needed, and uh, and and our MD giving the giving the script in the beginning, and it was pretty good at the end, and and didn't didn't need so much. I mean, practically no data. Some some like uh, correction of data in terms of the photos, but uh, uh, but it was pretty easy. And of course, then many of the uh, applications related to generative AI. I mean, you don't you just discuss with it, but the problem is that you don't you can't really trust in what's coming out. So you have to do some some checking anyways. But then you don't even need any of your own data in that. Thanks. Maybe one more question from the room, and then I have a couple more on the line here. Anyone here? This one in the front row. Please state your name. Again, the green microphone. Hello, my name is Salim, and um, the AI economy is here to stay. However, the first response for schools was to ban ChatGPT, not realizing that our kids will be living in a post-ChatGPT world. Uh, I'd love to hear any of your comments on whether you think it's too early to start kids on AI or is there a certain uh, age limit or I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Great question. Well, this is a tricky question. I, I can't say the age limit. <laughs> the good answer to everything, it depends. <laughs> It so depends. Yeah. 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 I, I th yeah. yeah. But I think uh, the kids can't evaluate the uh, results when they're asking. But maybe you should uh, kind of think about what are the capabilities of the certain kid. But I wouldn't give this for very young kids. But you can continue. <laughs> Keep the age. <laughs> At least the, the, there's a great, great group uh, in Facebook. There's 14,000 uh, members. It's in Finnish, but you can also uh, discuss in English. So it interests a lot of teachers and students at the moment. And of course, experimentation you can use 
really, uh, really fast, but the disruption is not about how the people learn, it's about how you test them. What are the skills they need in, in the future? So I would, in a safe environment, definitely encourage to try this, but at the same time, whoever is the teacher or uh, designing the schooling system, they need to understand the disruption, Gen I, also metaverse and other technologies. But you can experiment already, definitely. In the respect of time, there's one more question. It is addressed to Patrick and to Matti. So would you mind Patrick once more stepping up here? And while you are walking, I'll read the question. So um, what is the strategy of the Finnish government to support uh, AI, especially the small companies? Uh, I wonder why you asked me here because it's, I'm, it's, I'm it's, not. It's, it's, it's stated <laughs> that the question should be addressed. I, I'm to you. not the representative <laughs> of the Finnish government. Yeah, we but all know I that. Would, but I would say that that uh, I think many people here know very well that that Finland was one of the first countries having a, an AR strategy, and uh, uh, that's uh, not even the previous government to what we have now, but the pr previous to that. And I actually asked very recently uh, a, a person from the, from the government, mm -hmm. where is the AI in the present government's strategy? Mm -hmm. And the answer I got was that it's, it's there in a way implicit in this digitalization work that they are doing. It's not like forgotten. That was the answer I got. But now I'm giving like uh, uh, another person's answer. So maybe maybe you know more than i about what the government thinks i'm i'm not working for the government either but uh, but they have a very good program uh, i must say uh, and and they business finland already had they had their ai program it's already finished i mean so uh, so it's it's been there but but also business finland is is saying that ai is in in their every program so it's not a, it doesn't need a separate program any longer and, uh, and certainly uh, uh, the, uh, the investments in R&D that the government is doing, actually there's this, uh, the previous uh, parliamentary R&D uh, group actually aligned the development. And, and, and so we are looking forward to the increase of the R&D funds because that's, that's quite essential in the development. But otherwise, uh, I think that uh, we are hoping that our investment that the technology industry did will uh, encourage other, a lot of other public and private investments into AI and, and rather sooner than later. Can I add a completely different thing? Because Please I would like to come back to the question that was here by, while I was asked to come up here. So uh, I, I think you said something about that the, the schools do not allow TP or what did you say? Uh, that's interesting because uh, if we go from the top, the universities have taken very clearly a stance, uh, all universities I know about, especially the ones that I'm involved with, so Aalto University of Helsinki say very clearly that ChatGPT is allowed. Uh, uh, you can, as a teacher, course by course also give limitations, but the main thing is that generally speaking it's allowed, with some small exceptions. Uh, uh, and then uh, I have also seen uh, the recommendations uh, related to the, 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 the universities of applied sciences, the same thing. I have been talking to very many uh, school teachers, but that's the level of, of like uh, uh, the, the more advanced, so not the really small kids. And they all are like very okay, that they are using ChatGPT and, and discuss this. So I, I, I'm a little bit surprised about this, that somebody would say, say no, maybe it's the really small kids. All right, I, it I, is. I, I could add that uh, the kids are too much on the screen, so maybe that's, that's the reason. Mm. <laughs> hey, dear everyone, it is half past, uh, time flies. Big thank you to uh, Matti and, 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 and uh, Teknologia Teollisuus, Finnish technology industries, letting us come over here, because I know there's something, some refreshments behind the corner. So the networking time starts now. Thanks all of you in the room and on the line, uh, giving both these for the, for the upcoming AI Mondays. Um, I'm sharing it on my screen, but it's not visible there. So is it visible in the, are people on the net seeing this one or my screen, that one? Anyhow, um, 
uh, education, ethics, recruitment, sustainability, um, are maybe the words that are, are thickest in the middle of the screen. So uh, thanks for the feedback and uh, thanks for joining this part. Um, networking starts. Hey, what's the energy level? Yes. Thanks, the line.